Today is July 31st. Welcome to Native Calgarian. Hoki Naganago Mekoche Chestokomaki or Dekot Nagote Ne Siku. Hi, my name is Red Thunder Woman. My married English name is Michelle Robinson, and I use she and her pronouns. I'm speaking to you on the lands of the Nitsitapi, which is the Blackfoot Confederacy. The Blackfoot south of the imposed US Canadian border are the Blackfeet. And north of the border are the Siksika, Gunai, and Bagani of the Confederacy. These lands are Treaty 7, signed September 22, 1877, with signatures that include the Blackfoot Confederacy, the West Sea Chiniki and Bears Paw Nation of the Stony Nation, and the Dene from Sutina Nation. I acknowledge all First Nation, Metis, Inuit, status, and non status across Turtle Island as the keepers of these lands. All non Indigenous are treaty partners with the government signing on your behalf. It's important to understand that the straight agenda and gendered violence was and is forced on these lands by Christian outsiders. Land acknowledgements are critical for creating a safer space, a space for Indigenous, as well as honoring the host as a guest and honoring and acknowledging your role as a treaty partner in a so-called time of reconciliation. It's important that land acknowledgements have meaning. I encourage all people to introduce themselves with the acknowledgement of their ancestors stories of displacement and how you perceive your role as a treaty partner, a citizen of Canada, a refugee, and other land displacement so that we as Indigenous people know how safe you are to be around. If you don't know how to pronounce your local Indigenous nations names, won't say your pronouns, won't say your story of origin, won't acknowledge stolen lands, won't acknowledge imposed economic oppression, your role in reconciliation, show up at free seminars, uh, go to powwows or other events that you're invited to. I determine how safe you are to be around my community, my family, and myself. Understanding land acknowledgements and their importance is Indigenous 101 because it immediately addresses colonialism, oppression dynamics, broken treaties, and lies taught today in Canadian schools nationally. That's why settlers and those who call themselves Native Calgarians, show me, that you have no Indigenous 101 understanding. My Dene lineage roots me in the land of the Great Bear Lake people in Treaty 11. My people wore rabbit skins, so it's been referred to as the land of the hair people. I'm a native to Turtle Island, and my Dene nation is a visitor to this area of Pincho Tene Indahe in Satu Dene, meaning many big dog town, named after the Calgary Stampede. I was born in Calgary or in Blackfoot, Mokinstis, as Michelle Elliott, an English name which has afforded me privilege in an English colonial world. My mother is Northern Slavey Dene or Satu Dene, but my Indian American Post status card by the Canadian government says Yellow Knives Dene. Through my father, I am a daughter of the Mayflower, a daughter of the American Revolution, and I have an Indian American Post status card, which is a colonial construct, which by Canadian policies is meant to divide Indigenous peoples' inherent rights. Indigenous Two-Spirit or the Indigenous LGBTQ2 plus community and Indigenous women are at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder because of colonial trauma, imposed poverty, racism, gendered violence, and land theft. As a Dene woman who attempted to run after joining harmful colonial policies, or parties, sorry, um, and spent money to be at expensive conventions, I left home to travel to those conventions to vote on incomplete policies that allow for incarceration, a denial of justice, a denial of health services, racism, colonial trauma, and genocide of Indigenous and Black peoples. I have worked to continue reports to advocate for and attempt to work within these systems meant to harm me and my community. I can't say, you know, have a great August long weekend when I know that my community is dying from the current drug policies and systems of imposed Christian-based drug policies with abstinent programming, private health care, justice built on racism, land theft, and imposed British contracts and constructs that continue genocide on in all Indigenous people. I'm sad to report that Frank Young uh, was found and there was no Amber Alert. And since the Pope's um, trip, there's been a, a woman named Dawn Walker and her seven-year-old son that have gone missing. And she was a part of the executive of the uh, AFSIS. So, or, a, or FNIS, sorry. So as a result, you know, we have another missing and murdered Indigenous woman and her son, and everybody seems a okay with it in Canada. Um, I see what goes on in Twitter, and I, I don't know what to do about it. Like, I don't know how to, 
have progressive, so-called progressives see it. But I will talk a little more about um, conservatives and their way they vote, because we have a really great example of racism and conservatism and how they go together in their thinking. So anyway, I think of I think of Don Walker and her son, and I want to honor their lives and so many others. And I want you to see a role in the importance of stopping harm as a citizen and see your role in reconciliation. I honor the Blackfoot as the elders and members have been kind to me on my Red Road journey. Elder Red Crane taught me how to pronounce my spirit name in Blackfoot and Leonard Kenny taught me how to pronounce my spirit name in Satu Dene. My humblest apologies to the Blackfoot and elders, uh, Dene elders and language keepers as I try to learn proper pronunciation. Any mistakes or misinterpretations of the entire podcast are on me. I encourage questions so that misunderstandings can be cleared up as soon as possible. I do not speak on behalf of all Indigenous. I just share my journey as I walk down the red road. Uh, it's funny, I've been accused of not being kind while surviving genocide, but I have given so much free information, book clubs, podcasts, and there's actually been many others that have also given free information and podcasts and books. So, you know, at this point, it is willful to be ignorant on these issues. My Patreon account is Native Calgarian, where you can pledge and support. Thank you, previous donors, for showing your support. If you value listening or watching and can afford to give, thank you. For those who cannot afford to give, I'd love to hear from you at nativeyyc at gmail.com, where you can send your comments and your questions. Also, uh, giving a review helps on whatever medium you're listening from. I have a pinned post on uh, all my social media. You can go to YouTube. You can go and subscribe there. I've been going live on TikTok at 4 p.m. on Sundays. So I don't know if that's of interest to you. But I hope that hitting all these different demographics spreads the message. Because I'm not going to lie, I feel pretty gaslit uh, this week out of all weeks. Um, I'm sure many other Indigenous people do too. So let's get into it. Uh, I wanted to just post our book club from last month because I thought it was important that we get that out there. But this week, out of all weeks, I guess, are probably more important because of the Pope's historic um, decision to come here. So I think what I might do is, for those who watch my YouTube, I have the ability to share the screen. And I'm going to do that because it's important to me that folks kind of see, if they're following my YouTube, that they can see what it is I'm talking about. So for folks who don't know, uh, obviously, the Pope came to Calgary or to Canada, sorry. And I think everyone in the world knows that because whatever the Pope does, so many folks follow. Um, so I thought it would be really important for me to share with everybody this really good link. And I'll be sharing it in all of my um, promotion of this. Uh, CBC's radios, the, the house, the calls to action, and what is next. Now, first, this was last updated July 30th. And that matters because... Since then, the Pope has said on his trip home that he recognizes what has happened in Canada as genocide. So even though I've been saying it for how many years on this podcast, even though Indigenous people have been saying it in how many reports for years, there's so many Canadians that have been in denial of the genocide of Indigenous people. So it was really important for the Pope to say it. And our people recognize that importance by demanding he um, acknowledge it in an apology in uh, TRC 58. So in this one, the reason why I brought it to everybody's attention was at about um, 1504 in this conversation between, uh, ooh, how do I say his name? So Nigon Sinclair and his father Murray Sinclair, there's a really important part where he talks about the headdress, this headdress that everybody's been talking about that uh, Wilton Little Child put onto um, the Pope. And it's important because, I, and I've said this many times on my podcast, through my social media, typed it out, said it on videos, whatever it takes. This is actually about the residential school survivors and all of the thousands of testimonies that were given and the importance of it being given to um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission when they were doing their testimonials, that these 94 calls to action were very specific 
to the Pope apologizing on behalf of the church. And a lot of people don't feel that that was completed because there's not just call to action 58 that asked for the Pope apology, but at, he never said it in Alberta. Apparently he said it in other places that he did acknowledge sexual abuse, but he didn't at first in Alberta. He also didn't do the other calls to action when it comes to the church and he didn't rescind the doctrine of discovery. And I think that uh, that's going to be a push for a lot of people now. Uh, for some folks, they may not even know what the doctrine of discovery is. And I was just looking on my phone and I found a good one from the National Post that actually talked a bit about what is the doctrine of discovery. And um, again, folks who don't know, obviously, didn't read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report, so you outed yourself for not understanding it, and um, you outed yourself for not understanding why the Pope came. And now you've seen a lot of Indigenous people really upset, really upset about everything. And the biggest reason is that everybody's trauma is being reopened. And even though that is happening, many of our elders still wanted that apology because non-Indigenous people don't recognize us as people. They still see us as savages. So unless somebody like the Pope says these words, it's not recognized by Canadians. And because they are colonial in nature and teaching and generations of upbringing, they don't respect anybody else's authority but the leader. They don't listen to anybody else. So of course that creates that dynamic that if the Pope doesn't do it, then it won't be acknowledged. And I did actually learn a few things from um, this particular episode on the CBC house. I only got about 16 minutes into it. And then I had to, um, I wanted to rehear exactly how it was said about the headdress, which I'll try to get to um, right away here. This matters because there's so many things that the actual co-commissioner of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission said, and it was him and uh, Chief Wilton Littlechild that heard all these testimonies that were forced to listen to this. There was a, a woman as well, she's a non-Indigenous woman, and she um, married an Indigenous man. So um, I think Stephen Harper and at the time the original conversation about doing the TRC was kind of put out there. You know, they wanted somebody non-Indigenous. And I think if you were going to force a non-Indigenous person to be at the helm, of course, it had to be um, somebody that at least understood Indigenous people somewhat. Uh, anyway, getting off track. So back to uh, this particular episode on the CBC House. Um, it was said, and the importance of the the church not really being properly recognized as the culprit of genocide is that even when the government said okay we have to stop indian residential schools it was the only people from the catholic church from the churches in general that wanted to continue with indian residential schools because they had felt they hadn't accomplished their mission and still needed government support and to me that is like is an evil thing to say a horrible thing to say but for most canadians that's still how they feel when it comes to apprehending children throwing indigenous people in prisons whatever it is that they do that is evil towards indigenous people they just justify it and even at despite all of the awful known about indian residential school there was still a segment of the church and its followers and its leaders wanting to continue with Indian residential schools and the forced genocide. And then on top of it, we still had, um, like today, we still have priests, etc., that deny the gravity of Indian residential schools uh, genocide. And we have conservative leaders that do that as well. So it's really important that these calls to action about the church get properly implemented. That's why for me, when I see, you know, this 
uh, association of churches here in in Calgary not talk about this not work towards reconciliation it's just we're not there and we need the churches to understand their role in what uh, redress and reparation and all of these things and un unlearning has to be so um, another thing that was said was um, and I'm going to share the links with uh, Brandy Morin, who took a five minute video of Chief Wilton Littlechild talking about the headdress, because the headdress itself has caused a huge uproar. Um, first of all, it's not for non Indigenous to talk about, frankly, and you don't get an opinion. You don't, because you live with privilege and oppression over Indigenous people. So you don't get an opinion. That said, I think it's really important that there's an understanding that that bigger picture is that they have a role to play. If you want an opinion so damn bad, the very least you can be doing is pushing your churches, is pushing your sports clubs, pushing your business, pushing um, every, the people you vote for to acknowledge Indigenous um, pain, trauma, and genocide, but also start working on the solutions that have been laid out in the 94 calls to action, as well as the 231 calls to justice of the National Inquiry on Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women. So uh, another thing that was said in that CBC radio interview between the gone uh, Sinclair and his father was about this headdress. And now you have to understand that Murray and Wilton Little Child are, are very close friends and know each other really well. So it's perfectly acceptable for Murray to call him Willie, but I would never call him that. Obviously, I would call him Chief Little Child every time. Um, anyway, he said that he really seen that uh, act of giving that headdress with the deepest, most profound respect and an act of love, etc. So if you if you listen to that which I encourage you to listen to that CBC radio interview, um, you'll hear that. So if we have Wilton Little Child and Murray Sinclair talking about the importance of a, you know, a Cree man giving his grandfather's headdress to the Pope, you know, we don't really get a say in this. And, and again, these are the folks that listen to the thousands of survivors' testimonials when it came to the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So really important. Uh, that that said and you know I, I seen somebody share what I had shared about this and said um, they actually they didn't share my words they shared his words and they were like oh I didn't know this and as much as they're trying to be an ally they're still outing the fact that they actually didn't read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's 94 calls to action because had they they would know these things anyway um, really important conversation. Uh, so I was at the Bagani Rodeo. I missed some of the um, commentary that was coming out, but I'm trying to put together a few of the things that I seen that I thought was most important. Another link I'm going to be sharing is actually a Toronto Star. Um, they have um, a former M MP, Romeo Saganash, who also attended Indian residential school, uh, talking about this. And, it was really important to like it. Anybody who has knows anything about Canadian politics knows that Romeo Saganash's partner also talked about the importance of getting weekly flowers because of his Indian residential school experience. Um, he's a Cree from Northern uh, Quebec, and uh, he talked about being forced to attend it in the TRC publicly in many ways, but in this particular um, article, he said that his elder brother, John, was one of 14 Saganash children that was forced to attend in 1954 at the age of five. He died a, a year later, but there were no records or acknowledgement, and it took a chance encounter 40 years later before the family learned where he was even buried. Um, when Saganash's er elderly mother asked him to check and make sure that little John's name was included on the red memorial banner, on Monday's papal address, marking him as one of the 4,000 children who died and never returned from Indian residential school. He hesitated for a week. I was afraid that he wouldn't be on the list. And that would have been devastating, not only for me and my siblings, but also my mother, who was already frail by this time, Saganashu 
um, said in an interview. So I checked and John was on the list. Um, so obviously that's a huge release for them. But when I first read this, I was live on TikTok and it really like whew, gave me some tears because this is the horror of Indian residential schools and the genocide. And for most Canadians, they're more worried about, you know, the heat that we're experiencing right now, which yes, is important, but um, again, we have climate change because non-Indigenous people won't listen to Indigenous voices. Another episode for another day. So I guess Pope Francis was uh, photographed with kissing that red banner, um, but his demonstration of conviction ran horribly false for Saganash. I'm enraged about the fact that he not only said what he said in Rome in April, first last, um, referring to the apology for the actions of a uh, number of Catholics. So again, by not taking full responsibility of the church as a whole, being the per perpetrators of this abuse, he has hurt Indian residential school survivors. So it's not a full apology for a lot of them. Um, so a lot of people feel that he, it was just a slap in the face. And respectfully, I, Romeo Saganash, I have the deepest respect for for surviving Indian residential school and being open and honest about all of the things it takes for people to understand the gravity of this and yet downplayed, ridiculed, ignored by so many Canadians. Um, what else do I want to say about that? It was said that the apology should be modeled after the one made in 2010 to Irish victims abused by Catholic priests, a statement that spoke of criminal acts and expressed shame and remorse in the name of the church. That was not done. Uh, it obviously wasn't done within a year of being released as well. So like, obviously there's many, many people who feel really upset by the way he said it. And right, Romeo Sagan Ash, rightfully in my opinion said, probably a whole army of lawyers who went through his text in Rome to make sure that he is liability free, or at least the church is liability free. And while I agree with Mr. Uh, Saganash on that, I, at the end of the day, there is still actually liability that has already been found legally that the church actually has not paid out, even though they're required by law to, and they haven't released their documents either. So, uh, Murray Sinclair released a statement and it's not linked in here, but I did share it on my social media. And what he said that I thought was the most important things that he said was in many instances, it wasn't just collaboration, but an instigation. There are clear examples in our history where the church called for the government of Canada to be more aggressive and bold in its work to destroy indigenous culture, traditional beliefs and practices. And, um, I thought that was really, really important that people understand the gravity of that. Um, we're still looking for the bodies as well. There was a few quotes from Chief Phil Fontaine and uh, a lot of people mistakenly say negative things about him, but his testimony, not testimony, his, his words in the House of Commons that are on record are literally the impetus that caused a lot of this Truth and Reconciliation Commission to even be launched. So it's important people understand the history of all of this as well. Um, but a, a lot of people see this apology as half-assed, you know, half-apology. Um, there was a group calling itself the Mohawk Mothers, and they were going to protest him when he arrived in Montreal. And while I haven't seen that yet, I'm really excited to, and I'll share it when I get an opportunity, I did see that banner that went down that said rescinding the doctrine of discovery. So that's really important as well that people understand that. And um, I want to give a quote from those folks from the Mo Mohawk mothers, rather than apologies for forcibly attempting to wipe indigenous people off the globe. We want what we never ceded our land. We will not accept the Vatican's whitewashing of its barbaric history in Canada while it's still being the largest private landowner in the world, which is another bone of contention of how many people 
we're actually, um, you know, talking about the amount of money that it was costing the Canadian taxpayers to bring him here. Um, for folks who don't know, in Alberta, there were uh, parts of Mos Moscow cheese and parts of Lac Saint uh, Anne. I want to say anyway, one of the one of the Métis settlements. Everybody does literally a Catholic pilgrimage. Uh, a pilgrimage. Pil oh, I'm sorry, I'm stumbling on this. There's a place where people literally go every year to, you know, do a religious belief system, Christian religious belief system. But ironically, prior to the Christians coming, this lake was considered a sacred lake by many of the different nations. So anyway, every year everybody goes there and baptizes themselves. And um, the Pope visited there as well. And, you know, again, pavement in places there never was before. And a lot of people are upset about that. Understandably, the amount of taxpayer money that went to this, when they themselves own the most land, they have a legal obligation to still pay money that they've chosen not to. They still have documents that legally they've been told they have to release that they've chosen not to. So we, we have many layers of why this is so painful and hurtful for the Indigenous community. So obviously that's why you're seeing a lot of Indigenous people not support Wilton Little Child's um, act of putting on a headdress and, and giving them that headdress. But again, I will emphasize it is not non-Indigenous place to talk about it, but two, it's, uh, it's a pain. It's our trauma being exposed. So uh, as an act of racism, we have lateral violence and internalized racism that's what racism causes so now we have people really loud on twitter on tiktok on facebook saying this person has no right to speak for indigenous people this place this person has no right to speak for the free but if you were to listen to what Milton little child said in, in brandy morin's uh five minute piece if you listen to murray sinclair talk about it on the cbc piece you will hear a little more of the teaching, a little more of the understanding and how this is a personal decision from the little child's family to do. And uh, one thing that I haven't heard being spoken of that I, I think is important because it helped me make peace a bit more with Harper, Notley and Justin Trudeau getting head pieces was, um, you know, our leaders acknowledge their leaders and, and give them the headdress. But something that's never been really spoken about is a bit of a spiritual belief system that we have and how our ancestors will in in spirit work with the ancestors of people and that's really not my place to really elaborate further on in this podcast so um the last thing i want is non-indigenous to steal that again something else from us so i, I try not to talk about ceremonial things on this podcast and just talk about the blatant clear racism sexism and inequities that are clear in canada and um, at the end of the day if the pope's visit um garnered you know tens of millions of dollars being spent then we can easily like that um have clean drinking water for everyone we just clearly choose not to so that's um something I actually said on some interviews I was interviewed a few times over the course of the week and a few times in Toronto once if not twice in Winnipeg um, and you know again it's that bigger picture that had anybody really listened to Indigenous people they would know this they would know these truths and it was cut from some of the segments that I was uh, quoted within so I just wanted to emphasize that here on my podcast um, so I hope that kind of talks a bit about the uh, the act of of giving that, and I want to acknowledge that the Pope did say genocide on the on the way out of Canada, but he didn't rescind the doctrine of discovery. And the Church has a lot of work to do that I'm not sure its followers are prepared to do because I've seen a lot of shitty comments about oh it's only about money, it's. Uh, you know get over it already like those types of racist sentiments that have been perpetuated by canada for ever so 
my hope is that Canadians start pointing those fingers at themselves and seeing their role in reconciliation. And um, with that, I also want to uh, talk about my book club that's coming up. Unreconciled by Jesse Wente is our next book. I'd really love to see folks join that. Um, I haven't put the MMIW inquiry chapters three and four up yet, just because it's been really busy with the Pope and maybe we'll uh, launch it right after this. We'll see how, uh, see how the family feels. It's a stupidly hot day here, um, three days in a row. I actually came home from Pakani just exhausted. Um, not heat exhaust exhaustion quite yet, but I did learn that the um, draft from rolling down the windows still affects my neck, even though it's like 30 degrees out, like it was so hot. Uh, funny story. So I went to Pakani's uh, brand new gas bar. It's gorgeous. Go there. If you're in Brockett, you know, there's, you'll see it. It's beautiful. Um, they have a gift shop, they have uh, the gas bar, and I guess they have some food in there, but I didn't even go inside, I just heard about it. I stopped, I went to the one pump that wasn't working, take, took off my gas cap and went to pump, it wasn't working, it was annoyed. <laughs> so obviously the ancestors thought that was funny, and I forgot to put my gas cap back into my engine, or in, back into the... Um, uh, area where you put that and uh, took off and then I didn't realize until I went Claire's home has the cheapest gas in Alberta I swear to god and because of it they had uh, I that was where I found out I forgot my gas cap back in Brockett so I just think that's the funniest story so then I stopped at every single little gas station none of them sell gas caps so I went to Walmart in Calgary here because it closes at 11 p.m. So I had enough time to go check. And sure enough, they only have it online. So I was kind of laughing at myself for being impatient. And uh, I got home and today I already went to the auto parts store and replaced it. So I just thought it was funny and stupid. And uh, another example of making fun of myself that we need to, you know, um, be all open and honest about how ridiculous all of this life is i mean it is supposed to be fun so if you're on my social media you'll see that i share a lot of stupid things every single day because it's fun um i am doing these TikToks uh 4 p.m on mountain because it, it was encouraged but honestly nobody comes to it so i don't know what to do so if you're listening and you're on TikTok, i'd like to know a better time that you would prefer but if you're a listener and you're not on TikTok, I want you to tell me that because I want to make sure I'm reaching out to different demographics and I'm, and I'm hitting people. Um, so that's kind of funny. So I'll, I'll probably make a TikTok basically saying that same thing. Uh, what else did I want to say? Um, oh, the Reconciliation Action Group is, uh, you know, I hope people are inspired by the Pope. And I hope they strongly consider joining a reconciliation committee, whether it's at work, whether it's at school, um, whether it's at their church, preferably at their church, because you got a lot of work to do, dudes um, and dudettes, and those who I don't identify as either. So my hope is that you'll consider doing that um, and, and basically make your, you know, September to December schedule. I know you're all working on it, like consider what are you doing for reconciliation? Is it listening to like maybe a CBC podcast, maybe an Indigenous Voice podcast, um, something that you are doing? And I'd love to hear what it is that you're doing. Um, books that you read that you like. Do you only read one and then you're good for 20 years? Or do you read lots? Like I'd like to know what medium it is that you are learning from. Um, because I think that that's really important. Another thing I learned at the Pagani, I, I mainly went to the rodeo. I didn't even see the powwow. They have a beautiful arbor for the powwow, um, which is good because it was stupidly hot. And I don't know how anyone could be dressed in regalia. And in fact, um, I posted some um, video on my own social media and actually got on video. There was one of the Indian relay guys, he had heat exhaustion. So I hope he's okay. I've been kind of looking through the news to see if there was anything else that kind of added to that. But um, yeah, he got off his horse and he was so disoriented. And so I gave him a Gatorade and some water, but I don't, 
like I don't know if he's okay. Um, that's the thing about rodeo too. Like even prior, the medics had to go to a few of the different things, and I don't know why, and nobody knows why. But that's just rodeo, and I hate it. But anyway, it is a good good place to see indigenous representation of people in rodeo because unfortunately you don't see it through a lot of the mainstream rodeo despite it like literally was taught by indigenous people to cowboys how to rodeo anyway anyway whatever indian relay relay races are getting bigger and bigger and of course that was the biggest crowd at the end of it before the uh, grand entry for powwow and because i um I've been dying of, of this heat. I'm sad too, Dene. We're not used to this. Because I've been dying of the heat, I knew I had to travel back to Calgary when it wasn't like, I don't know, 36 degrees on the highway. So after that, I, I had something to eat and took off and went home. And, you know, I, I still was hot. And that's why I was so annoyed uh, when I lo lost my gas cap. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give a shout out to one of my aunties. Um, today she's getting married. I'm really sad that I'm not up in Yellowknife to see that, but we've just had anyone who listens to the show knows that basically that job in Lethbridge ruined our life financially. And um, we've had, of course, multiple vehicle issues as a result. Uh, during Stampede, I um, had to replace the pipes that go from the radiator. So I showed up at the stampede grounds. <laughs> my my uh, my hood was smoking. So we slept the night in the teepee and then uh, just limped it. I, I have AMA. So I was like watching the heat. If it got too high, I was going to shut it down and then uh, get it towed to my mechanic. But it didn't overheat from the stampede to my mechanic. So I got it to my mechanic and he replaced my exhaust pipe. So <laughs> I mean, Everybody has vehicle maintenance, but it's just that when you're already broken, destitute because of, you know, pandemic, job loss, and just feeling like utter and complete crap from the economic times right now, and then having the audacity to have so many people deny what you're going through, like it's just, it's just the worst time. That's why when people ask me, how are you doing? I have a really hard time asking or answering that because you know, there's this expectation that, oh, this is another thing I want to talk about, the expectation of Indigenous people to operate not just at 100% at colonial standards, but to do it in the heat during powwow season while the Pope is here. Like, it, it's so hurtful and insulting and just shows the lack of Indigenous understanding and it's so prevalent right now. Um, I've seen a lot of Indigenous people turning down media because media hasn't done the work. Uh, they haven't done the work of learning about the calls to action. So their questions, almost every single one of them, are answered if they were to open up the 94 calls to action. But I did try to take as much as media as I could. And the reason why I do it is because I have a platform uh, a small one, uh, be it at that. But the other part is that I want to honor people who already did their testimonials. And obviously, if media is too lazy to even open up the calls to action, just point to them and guide people there. So um, yeah, let me know if you listen to any of it. I've seen a few folks post on my my uh, Facebook that they heard me in their their city. So I really appreciate that feedback. Uh, thank you for letting me know. And um, please, please, please consider joining a reconciliation committee if you haven't done it. There's no time to, it, there, there's no reason not to start now. And there are wonderful Indigenous voices across this country, no matter where you are. So please consider listening to them. I'm proud that this podcast has given solutions, cultural safety training or first aid, and all of them for creating a safer space for Indigenous people of color, those with a disability, and LGBTQ2 to speak. Thank you to authors Cheryl Ward, Christy Branch, and Alicia Fritkin of heretohelp.bc.ca, and they have a whole article about what is Indigenous cultural safety and why I should care about it. And, you know, I really want folks to support Indigenous work as part of their reconciliation and settler understanding. I'm lucky enough to highlight and repeat it here, but I've seen a lot of 
non-Indigenous have takes about this whole thing and yet still aren't amplifying Indigenous voices. Um, worse, I've had to block a lot of non-Indigenous because they almost come onto my uh, podcast um, social media is just to harass the Indigenous community. So I, I have zero tolerance for that. I just block them. But, um, you know, I know my non-Indigenous followers aren't calling them out, aren't, you know, reporting it even enough to tell me about it. I have to go back and find it. So thanks for triple the work, folks. Um, internalized racism and lateral violence. Again, I kind of talked a bit about it, about the infighting, about the headdress issue. Uh, but again, this is a, actually created by the structure of racism imposed on these lands. So that there's a power dynamic there that non-Indigenous clearly aren't getting. But if you are a person who is Indigenous, I strongly recommend racial, racialequitytools.org. What is internalized racism by Donna Bevins? Because it really does have a lot of resource files on how to deal with the white supremacy that we have to face. And I, I really want to face it together in arms. Um, do's and don'ts for bystander intervention by American Friends Service Committee. This is another great resource for, so that if you see racism, that you know how to act. I actually seen other people uh, talk about acting on women's behalf and Julie Lalonde having resources for that. So clearly there is some understanding of it, but people don't want to really deal with those solutions. Um, Indigenous have been talking about our issues, sharing our traumas in reports, commissions, and public hearings, just so it can be regularly disregarded. No more. Honor our words. Honor the treaties. Listen to politicians and their policies and platforms. If they don't recognize the marginalized in their budget with gender equity plus, if they're cutting, cutting violence prevention programs and services, uh, Indigenous education, uterus health choices, gay straight alliances, lack of human rights for migrants, immigrants, folks with disabilities. Know that your vote to that party directly negatively um, impacts people and demand that they implement the Truth and Reconciliation Commission reports calls to action, the recommendations of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, the multiple reports about child welfare reform, violence prevention, and now 231 calls to justice from the National Inquiry on missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit Denying those reports is a form of abuse called gaslighting. Our people are experiencing extreme racism in the educational health and justice institutions with multiple reports that say the same thing. Demand change from election platforms and politicians. So if you're following here in um, Alberta, whew, it's been a pretty hot mess with the UCP. Most recently, Danielle Smith uh, blamed folks with stage four cancer for their illness. And um, Abacus data actually came out with some really, really alarming um, stats about, not just about um, conservatives, but racial biases when it comes to conservatives, but also centrists, which I thought was important to mention because centrists, this is why they're so dangerous because at the end of the day, they will side on oppression in order to maintain their privilege, as will conservatives. And um, it's just so well highlighted in this abacus data that uh, was, was, I shared it. Um, it was David Coletto who shared it. He said about one in three Canadians believe that white people are discriminated against more now than visible minority groups in this country. Um, and the federal relationship, their vote shows very clearly that um, the people who identify as conservative, the blue is like really high up there with 53% believing that white people are actually discriminated against um, uh, in that, which is really sad and pathetic of the 35% that believe that. So it, it's just really sad and alarming when I read that. Um, Obviously, red is better, but as you know, they're they're centrists. So a lot of centrists will like when the liberals win, it's because the conservatives are so bad that a lot of them are willing to vote 
liberal. So what's really alarming that if you go on to Dave Pilato's uh, Twitter, and I, I did retweet this, but it basically shows that um, the conservatives are winning and that they don't like this conversation on reconciliation and that they, Canadians are split 50-50 on their worldview. 51% think the world is a dangerous place and the priority must be to protect ourselves. Whereas 59% believe that the world is mostly safe and our priority must be to embrace its opportunities, which, ugh, I don't know. I, I will never understand this. Um, anyway, he, oh, by the way, he also became a, an uncle again. So congratulations on Joseph. But regardless, there was one about centrist. As half of the centrist um, Liberal Party wins these elections, basically what they're saying here is that because Trudeau's uh, the highest he's ever been in a disapproval rate, that a lot of those centrists from the Liberal Party are going to go conservative because the conservatives are leading by 35 points over the Liberals 30 points. And um, that's really, really sad, I think, because if the conservatives would have been empowered during this um, COVID time, I don't know. I think there would be like so many more people, myself included on the streets. And that that's really sad to me. I, I, um, I don't understand the hate against Trudeau. I just don't. I think um, the average Canadian is ridiculously lucky to have him at the helm. Whereas like with indigenous people, we have some really great work that we've done with the indigenous people's commission, but like I didn't have, you know, Wi-Fi at Bukhani's uh, radio, rodeo. And I brought that up with a friend who met well when she said this, but at the end of the day, it means more because I was at convention and we've already voted on these policies and they're supposed to be going through. And I know that um, they're working on it. And I know that there's like a 10 year plan in order, in order to implement um, the 231 calls to justice, the 94 calls to action, um, clean drinking water, like all of it. I know it just, the government can take 10, 10 years to develop it. It's just hard when you know, if you can make a pavement for the Pope in a last minute decision to come here, why the hell can't you give internet to the Connie Nation and so many others? Um, what clean drinking water? Anyway, I'm really getting off topic. I really wanted to bring your attention to this um, information. And for non Indigenous, you know, you can claim that Trudeau never fulfilled his mandate for Indigenous people, but you can't show me the NDP or the Conservative Party doing any better. And it's certainly not in their upcoming election. So spare me with that. If you have the audacity to say, oh, well, Trudeau didn't um, you know, fulfill his mandate on indigenous people, you better have a pretty good fucking alternative because so far nobody else is doing it. So anyway, welcome to my hellhole of living in Calgary, knowing how many people are openly um, having bumper stickers that say fuck Trudeau. Or, or flags even worse. And then having people saying, well, he didn't fulfill his mandate, but then being okay with the conservatives who like legitimately hate indigenous people, deny genocide, deny Indian residential school, um, have no intention of implementing the 94 calls to action. Like be honest about what you're spewing. And especially if you're gonna say it to me. Anyway, denying all these reports it's gaslighting and our people are experiencing this racism. So this needs to be understood by everybody. They have, if they don't understand colonialism, privilege, sexism, they have zero business running. It should be understood by all parties, local politicians, community organizations, sports, holy cow, as Hockey Canada got its ass handed it to them over the last week and rightfully so. There was a really good book uh, by Laura Robinson called Crossing the Line. And it's already 20 years old. Talked about Graham James, Sheldon Kennedy, uh, Eric Lindros, and how basically it's already an unspoken work that the Canadians and US do to take known rapists across the border for the NHL so that they can play hockey without there being problems. 
So like, I, I don't, some of the testimony that I was seeing literally to me was just a repeat of all that stuff. So I really hope she comes out with a sequel because this is ridiculous, ridiculous. And women's hockey isn't properly supported in Canada. So we claim that we're a feminist country, but I promise you, the dirtiest, dirtiest of politics, especially in Calgary, is like the NHL, Hockey Canada, the Stampede, and like um, conservatism and how that all breeds here. Like, ugh, I got to write a book about the Stampede that's like real. Anyway, I don't know what to say about that. I don't even know if anybody would read it. Um, a really great article that there is out there is uh, Truth Before Truth, How Non-Indigenous Canadians Become Allies. You know, I pray that people Google that. There are actually more articles now. If you're experiencing emotional distress after anything I talked about today and want to talk, you can call the First Nation and Inuit Hope for Wellness Helpline at 1-855-242-3310. It's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. If you go to their website, hopeforwellness.ca, they do also have a little text box. Uh, it's more related to missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit, you can call 844 Four one three six six four nine, and if you are non-indigenous, you can contact uh, the distress center lines in your area. They usually have a functioning two one one, or you can call eight three three four five six forty five sixty six. Sixty Scoop uh, Indigenous Society of Alberta. They also have resources. If you see or experience racism in Alberta, you can report it to Act to End Racism or text at 587-507-3838. Um, the Trevor Project, uh, they have lots of resources, uh, lifevoice.ca. So they, they have a trans lifeline, they have a youth, LGBTQ2 plus youth one. And of course the Trevor Project itself is 877-330-6366. So let's talk about substances. Um, do not use alone. If you are using alone, there is a National Overdose Response Service at 1-888-688-NORS for support. And there's two apps that you can get is Brave or DORS. Those two apps also help if you are using substances. This is really important to me because in April alone, we had over 115 drug poisonings and I really want to stop it. So again, Narcan is something that every Indigenous first, or every First Nation person has access to one a day. And for non-Indigenous um, in, in Alberta, you can go to any pharmacist and they should have a naloxone kit. They will give you no questions asked. I just happened to be talking to a human rights organization about this because the truth is pharmacists don't know. And I've been denied my right to a Narcan a day by one pharmacist. And the one I went to was also problematic at the start. Now they're giving it to me. Hopefully that will continue. So it's unfortunate, but we have to educate our own people. We have to educate everyone and we need to get these things readily accessible. There is no way you can misuse a Narcan or a Naloxone. Violence is my everyday reality. Every indigenous generation has faced it. This is self-care, how I take my power back, how I show my voice, but how we also talk about actual indigenous representation as opposed to non-indigenous deciding what's gonna get cut and what's gonna be said. Uh, that's why I started this podcast to speak freely without interruption, without tone policing, leadership shaming, gaslighting questions. As many people don't wanna hear my opinion, but sure wanna tell me theirs even though if they don't know anything about us or colonialism or the constant surveillance of our people, protests or rights. Um, I shared a really funny article and it, it's actually a little older, but it was when they were uh, monitoring the Wet'suwet'en, which is not funny. And they um, had, the RCMP had a drone and a helicopter crash into each other. So then they had to pay extra for a helicopter from Alberta to come get their helicopter and take it to get repairs. Like, to me, it's funny, but stupid and not funny about what it's doing to my Indigenous sisters at the Wet'suwet'en, uh, defend the Yan. Um, um, they have a 
what the word they use for land is yente. So defend the yente is a common thing that you'll see us reshare. Anyway, it's not funny, but laughing at it, it's the only humor I got at this point because non-Indigenous won't step up. Um, it's really important that people understand microaggressions are unacceptable and that they need to be trauma informed. Folks like me are dealing with internalized racism or gatekeeping as well. So, you know, there's resources that are just depleted over all of this. Internal and external racism is an everyday reality for me, Indigenous people, and folks with disabilities, uh, QT, BIPOC, and, and others. I want to say Masito to my ancestors. My granny, my mom of what strength looks like through your example. I want to say thank you to my dad for teaching me to be strong and blunt. My stepmom for showing me what a proud culture is through her Austrian family and roots and teaching me to be a proud Calgarian just through her. I'm a second generation proud Calgarian. And thank you to my husband, Darcy, a big Buffalo rock man, um, for producing and editing the show on top of being my husband, my childhood friend, father of our child and support down my journey of the red road. He has witnessed decades of racism and sexism into our child, uh, Thunderpipe Necklace Woman, who we are blessed to learn from daily. We are honored you chose us. You give me daily accountability to be a better and stronger person. My hope is my daughter and my family will be proud in the future of us trying to discuss these present day issues. My Patreon account is Native Calgarian, where you can pledge and support. Thank you, previous donors, for showing your support. If you value listening and watching I and can afford to give, thank you. To those who cannot afford to give, I'd love to hear from you at nativeyyc at gmail.com, where you can send in your comments or your questions. I also have a YouTube channel. You can go and subscribe. Go to nativecalgarian.com for the latest podcasts and pin posts on social media. And I want to and by giving side eye to those Calgary rabbits. You're lucky I'm not your dish. My beautiful cousin responded, or you'd be in my dish. Thank you so much for listening, folks. I hope you know I, I truly mean that.